So in a sense, it was kind of a nut shoot because there was uh, over 20 hours of daylight in a day at that time in, in and Sweden. And activities in, 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 throughout in the, the whole of those 20 hours, essentially. Yeah, so, so you know, we slept very little. Luckily, we had uh, Joe and Mike, our two camera guys, and Mike was also doing sound. Um, they were completely up for it. So, we, you know, we did just shoot and shoot and shoot. And, you know, that made the characters very used to our presence. But obviously there was a lot of strategy involved with who we put the radio mic on, who was, who should we follow to which workshop and so on at a given time. And we had to be very instinctive and we had to be constantly sort of evolve you know, and talk a lot about you know, what different people were going through and, and what stories we had follow. And obviously that's just one stage of it and you know, that was a kind of working incredibly quickly and kind of getting really as much material as we possibly could. And when it comes to the edit, that's a wholly different but stage. Also, and that was the instinctive way. And then the other way, which in some level is in- instinctive, is that Rob and I, before we even went there, when we would sort of daydream in my flat <laughs> in North London, we would say, OK, you know, when we'd heard a bit about the festival, we knew some of the workshops, we had a sort of sense, although it was totally fantastical, it was in our minds, of what a tantric sex workshop would be like. We thought, okay, what is it? Why do people do that? Well, they're looking for intimacy. They're looking for truth. And so we would, in our minds, think cinematically, what kind of images does that evoke? Okay, I can pick something else that's not kind of naked. You know, whatever, so they, they, other rituals they do, the fire walk, we imagine something very... Uh, powerful we knew there were drums would play so we had you know the sense of the energies around these events and so cinematically we had these ideas of what we'd want to do and we talk about it we go okay you know this is going to be passion you know if you're walking over fire you're going to be pretty much crapping yourself and or facing your fear and or kind of being as courageous as you possibly can how can we communicate that so we we built these kind of ideas of what it meant to communicate these feelings and then I guess couple that with mm. the reality of being there and then months editing. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's an interesting thing to, to schedule on structure because we knew what the main workshops would be. So we could kind of imagine what kind of experiences they'd be, therefore how we would want to shoot them, what kind of style, kind of form. And so what were those um, considerations when it came to style and, and, and form? Like experience, for experience. Yeah, experience. Want, I mean, you know, the main thing is we, we wanted to bring people into the experience of something. So one example, you know, the sweat lodge. Um, it's a dark pit. We knew, first of all, practically, you can't film people in there. It's not well, only it's it's too dark, degree heat. but it's very hot, it's steamy, <laughs> you can't have a camera in there. Therefore, you know, very early on we decided that would be a sound-centred thing, that, you know, we'd use sound, we'd, you know, really kind of try and bring out the experience of people in, in, in the sound that, we did that, that happens. And, you know, <laughs> so we well, yeah, yeah, how did we you, had how to did hang. You the sound? I did wonder well, that, because I was imagining the mics kind of melting away. Yeah, there. I mean, you have to basically cover the mics in condoms. You know, that's, <laughs> that's what you have to do. You have to put condoms over the microphones... Make sure they're completely sealed up, you know, so no moisture and heat can get inside. Mm-hmm. And then you you put them in, you know, under a layer of tarpaulin in, in the sweat lodge. Um, I mean, so, so it's you not know, exactly glamorous, so is it? So yeah, it's not it's not glamorous <laughs> it's, filmmaking. You know, you know that's the best sound you can get. You know, a slightly muffled sound, but you know, you're in a small space that is muffled. You know, that's kind of the experience. And then you know, with something like the kind of contact improvisation scene that happens in. Uh, during, well, they don't uh, know what that means. Murphy's, it's uh, the healing, healing scene where they all yeah. dance around, rolling on the floor. Um, well, you actually use something called a fig rig, which is invented know, by the director. Yeah. Yeah. Mike you know Figgis. Thing? Time code. Yeah, yeah, yeah so Mike it's Figgis. essentially a steering wheel. Yeah. And in the middle of the steering wheel, you put the camera. Yeah, um, and you know, we mean? actually yeah. use this through quite a lot of the film, and it's actually a you know, brilliant uh, device for God bless people to the fig use. Rig. <laughs> yeah. That is really the crux of it, the cinematographic style of our film. Yeah, it's a brilliant thing to use. We knew we had to use small cameras. We wanted to get a balance between quality and size of camera. And what cameras so, did you use? So we used the Sony Z1s, um, which is an HDV camera. It records at high definition resolution, 25. but onto mini DV tape. It's interlaced, but you can de interlace it later as we did. And the great thing is, they're small cameras, they're so unobtrusive. It's not like having a big shoulder mounted camera, which is so obvious that it puts people off. It's a small camera, you can move it around. And when you put it in the fig rig, you know, and obviously testament to Joe Russell, a fantastic cinematographer who's and he's you know, just brilliant, lovely and, and wonderful, very and skilled at handling it. And, it. and it means that you can. 
pull off all kinds of manoeuvres with the camera that you really can do with another camera. Well, just camera. imagine a steering wheel, you know. If, if, yeah, if you, it's, you, like you know, a, it's like a steering wheel and... With you a know, camera in the middle, so you can it, go nuts with it. It takes that all the shape that you'd have if it was handheld. You don't have all the hand movement. Um, but with something like uh, the scene I just mentioned, you know, you can, you know, we really wanted to get the camera moving around people as they're rolling around on the floor, you know, to kind of make almost a sort of lullaby kind of feeling to how the camera moves and how it follows people as they're kind of contorting into sort of weird and also, experimental you can, body shapes. And also you can lean on it. I mean, the joy of the fig rig is that, let's say you're following character A, and then suddenly character B next to you just darts two, three metres to the left. You can just move to the left and then plonk it on the ground and lean on it because it's like a steering wheel. So the camera's in the middle mounted on a bar in the middle of the steering wheel. So you can place the steering wheel on the grass and lean yeah, it back so and you've got essentially... It's a sort of you know, temporary stand. A, a temporary almost. stand. And the flexibility that gave us, I mean, and also as directors... Especially because we wanted to shoot a lot of stuff low from a low angle. And also so. the way we could tell Joe through the headpiece, you know, Rob and I, we were all connected via these sort of very, very budget walkie-talkies that thankfully did the job. But we could just say, Joe, go right now. And he could just, because there, there was no tripod, because there was none of that nonsense, um, he could just pick up, dart, move and set up. Mm-hmm. And oh, that's so that's good. So, like, what? How do you kind of work through the scenarios of how you would shoot? Because again, first feature, but you seem kind of pretty clued in. As you, we know, we want the fig rig. We know we're going to have this kind of talk back system so that we mm. can communicate with our cameraman without you know tapping him on the shoulder. Going, yeah, there. we had to do a bit of that though. <laughs> first of all, you know, we've been passionate about films for a number of years, so we we kind of know our taste and our style and our approach to perform I suppose and and I think um, for me like being an assistant director in the industry has kind of helped me kind of understand how how to yeah communication and how to logistically plan shoots and I think what we were faced with was a very sort of scaled down version of okay we've got a really small team we can afford a really small amount of equipment how can we best be flexible to communicate with each other and also be flexible enough to move quickly and get a kind of variety of shots and so we chose the kind of equipment I mean we shot some of the stuff I mean if the second cameraman for example was doing the sound if we couldn't communicate to him quickly enough it was literally a case of Rob or I literally just going over to him tapping on the shoulder he would just step to the side and we would just move that because that camera was on a tripod and we could move that in whatever we wanted to you know you've got to bear in mind there's four of you there is communication you're not going to fall into those traps of, of mm. sort of an enormous crew and loads of ADs yeah and then for instance in the sharing circles you know which is obviously a key thing to get right and to cover effectively obviously Joe was the the main cameraman we knew that he was going to shoot beautiful images of people speaking and reacting and we had a plan where we would have the second camera on a tripod all the time and, and we'd always make sure that whatever was happening, it was covered in either a wide shot or a two shot. And we had a sort of signal system, sometimes through the the radio, sometimes visually. So we we knew that whatever was going on, it was always covered. Actually, can we say... As soon as it was covered, you know, we could signal and and Joe could move to get a better shot or reaction That's the most important thing for any budding filmmakers listening to this, Mm -hmm. is that make sure you've got something covered because there are some scenes that, in fact some of the most dramatic scenes in our film most of it is shot you know if I say so myself really well I think considering the circumstances and everything um, and the scenes which are probably shot the least well in some ways are the most epic and dramatic and work even though the camera's shaking all over the place and something random has happened and it's really sudden and totally unexpected it's fantastic drama the camera essentially is showing you the shock the best thing that we ever did is that we were always making sure it was covered, that things were covered, mm. even if <laughs> it was and in a moment of chaos. Yeah, and sometimes they're not. And I think, you know, you've really got to make sure that 